chair. Um, I would like to introduce Alice Flusher. Alice is our speaker today, and Alice has been with the Master Gardeners um, for several years. She is currently the president of the Master Gardener Foundation here in Cowlitz County. And Alice is talking about solving summer garden problems. So Alice, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking today, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Gary. Okay. I'll bet you that you're here because you're experiencing garden problems and you're not alone. <laughs> I was out in my garden last night and I'll show you pictures of the flea beetles that I took when, once we get there. However, well, there's a story behind that, but I'll, I'll get to that. So, let's see. So today, what we're going to cover is we're gonna look at general growing problems and then we're going to kind of go over some common sense things that you can do to kind of get a handle on the problems. Then we're going to look at specific insect problems and then specific plant diseases and disorders. And I, the, the first thing that's important, and, and I can't stress this enough. Almost every single problem you have in your garden is tied somehow to how you're taking care of your plants. Not always because insects and diseases will come, but there is an awful lot you can do to protect your plants from, from those kind of problems. The first thing is to get a baseline soil test. If you've never had a soil test, get one now. Um, simplysoiltesting.com. It's all one word. Simplysoiltesting.com is a great place for an inexpensive soil test. And once you get that, they send you the results that are very easy to understand. And it gives you a good place to put your garden. You know, we always need nitrogen, but it lets you know kind of what your potassium and phosphorus are in the soil. And that's really important to know. And it, it'll save you money in the long run because you won't have to buy all these things to try to fix what you don't know what, what you're, you need to fix. Um, the other thing that you need with soil is it has to be well-drained. And we've had classes on how to check for that. And uh, Gary can send you links if you're interested in that. One of the most important things you can do for your garden, and, and you'll see later, it will protect your plants from a lot of... Um, a lot of disorders that happen. Keep your soil consistently moist. It should be like a wrung out sponge all the time. Don't wait until your plants are wilting a little bit to uh, water it. They should be moist all the time. And the best way to do that is to use a timer on um, drip irrigation. Your plants need at least six hours of sunshine each day, preferably more. The more the better. And again, the plant or the soil nutrition, the soil test will tell you what you need. But some plants need more nitrogen other than others, and it's good to know when you're planting those which ones those are. Unfortunately for us, most of the plants that we're going to be talking about today really prefer warm nighttime temperatures, and we don't have those here. But there are ways to get around it. And then uh, some of the other problems, of course, are insects and diseases. Hmm. There we go. So here are some problems you might encounter. You can have wilting from you because if you water too much, you're drowning the roots and they can't take up oxygen and, and they'll wilt. They, they can't take up moisture. Just uh, please mute your microphones. Well, 30, that's okay. So um, the, moisture is one thing that can cause a problem with wilting. You want to water deeply and when the soils dry about three inches down, down where the root zone starts, water again. You want to keep it moist all the time. There are some diseases, especially root diseases, that will cause your plant to wilt and some of them are fungal diseases, root infesting magnet, maggots, and we'll talk about those too, and some um, other ones, or root not mag uh, nematodes. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Very hot temperatures can cause temporary wilting and it'll correct itself overnight. And I have a feeling that you're gonna have a chance to see that happening 
this weekend when it's supposed to be above 100 degrees. If your plants are well watered and you know that the soil is moist, they may be really, really wilty by the end of the day. You probably don't need to uh, water them again if the soil is still moist. It's just the protective mechanism. The plant will kind of shut itself down so that it doesn't lose too much moisture. And then at night and by morning, it should be nice and perky again. And if your soil doesn't drain well, and this is true in a lot of places here, um, if it doesn't drain well, then um, amend it with organic matter like rotted leaves and, and straw and, and, thing, and, and compost and manure, or use raised beds, which is something that a lot of us have to do because of the soil, type of soil we have. And to avoid some of these uh, diseases I talked about there, the root diseases, try to plant resistant varieties. WSU and OSU both have really good um, publications, and they're on the uh, resource list at the end of this and, and on our website uh, that tell you how to do it and the problems that you might encounter with the certain vegetables and give you the ideas for resistant uh, varieties that grow well here. Um, you, the, if you start by seed, usually on the seed packet, you will see Oh, man, that, that's really touchy. I'm sorry. You'll see that they have uh, little codes there to tell you what they're resistant to. Here you would be mostly concerned about verticillium wilt for the uh, root rot viruses. So what if they're coming up really spindly and weak? Um, most of the time that's not enough light, which can happen in full sun if you're not planting them right. Look at that picture on the right. Um, do you see how when the sun is coming at a certain angle, these are planted east to west, these uh, trees right here on the lower right. The sun is on the west, and if something were planted really close, if the rows were planted a little bit more close, those would be in the shade, and they would not be getting enough light. And this can happen with corn, especially if corn is planted too close uh, together. They need all of the corn stalk needs to get some light. And also take a look at the structures on your property. Um, are, are they cutting down on your eight hours of sunlight? Another thing that can make them spindly is crowding them too much. Overcrowding, again, that will cut down on the sunlight, but it also crowds the roots. Too much water and too much nitrogen will um, make them like that. One time I started... Uh, so seedlings inside. I started seeds inside, and I thought I'd get a jump on the seeds, and, and I watered them, and I fertilized them, and, and honest to gosh, from seed to four weeks, I had tomatoes that were, oh, geez, they had to be over a foot tall, and I thought, look at you go. You're really growing, but those things had really soft stems. They were very, very very weak, and I was watering them too much, and I gave them too much nitrogen, and I had to start over again. They just couldn't manage. But as far as location goes, um, plant someplace and plant the plants far enough apart so that they can get lots of sun and plant your rows north to south so that they will get as much sun as they possibly can. So if you've got stunted growth and the leaves are pale green to yellow, you're probably not getting enough light. Sometimes the temperature is too cold. If you planted um, some of your plants out too early, you can get really light colored leaves or even purple leaves because the uh, air, the soil temperature is too cold and the plants can't take up the nutrition. And when that happens, the leaves are discolored. Sometimes too much water and poor drainage will cause studded growth because the roots aren't going. Um, Soil nutrition problem, of course, if the uh, you know the uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels aren't correct, or the pH is too low, uh, then the plant can't use what's in the soil if the pH is too low. So you want to reduce the water in the area if you can. Again, use raised bed if you have to, and um, in the absence of a soil test, add a balanced fertilizer or compost. Balanced means that you've got nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium in equal measure. Uh, one of the things that you want to do is to thin plants to reduce competition and to weed 
because they are also competing with the uh, plants for nutrients. And if, if your soil is too um, low, your soil pH is too low, which most of ours is, um, you'll want to add lime in the fall. Just get some and read the directions and apply it to the amount of space that you have and work it into the soil. And over the winter, your soil will sweeten and it will be the proper um, pH for plants next year. So, spots and holes in your leaves. Fungal diseases, viral diseases, viruses, unfortunately, we can do nothing about. Um, once your plant has a virus, uh, there's, there's no cure and it should come out. Chemical burns. Uh, a lot of people think that because they can make something at home, it's probably better for the plant, and that is not the case. A lot of these homemade insecticides are phytotoxic on the leaves. They will burn the leaves. They aren't made for plants. And the pesticides we do use, there are um, low toxicity ones, but they are made so that they won't hurt the plants. Um, always make sure that you read the instructions on the label too, because more is not better. If you look at the center picture there at the bottom, that is something a master gardener just sent me. Um, it's her prized tomato plant and she was all thrilled it was coming along just fine she's a new master gardener so she followed all the directions beautiful she sent me the picture she, she said what is going on well turns out her husband used an herbicide to clean out the weeds between the rows of plants and that herbicide drift caused the twisting and curling of the leaves and hopefully it'll outgrow it we don't know yet she's keeping an eye out for normal looking leaves to come out but if you live in a neighborhood and you don't use herbicide it could be that somebody else is or you could be have brought in manure that had that the um animals ate grass that had pesticides in it there's a lot of different reasons why you can get uh, pesticide damage to your plants without you having done anything and, of course, fun uh, fungal and viral diseases can also cause problems, and we will talk about those. So what happens if there's no fruit? You've got this great tomato plant. It is leafy and healthy and green looking, but there's no fruit. What's going on? Well, sometimes the temperatures are too cold and nothing's going to happen. Sometimes the temperatures are too hot, and that's going to happen this weekend. Above 85 degrees the um, plants will not, um, pollination won't occur. So you may have, the, the flowers will be there. They will probably fall off after this weekend and then new ones will come out. But uh, it, it just won't happen when the weather's that hot. If you've got too much nitrogen, you're going to have a big fluffy green plant and very few uh, flowers. So follow the instructions for that particular plant and most of the time you add a slow-acting fertilizer or um, a lot of compost to the when you first plant the plant. And then when the first fruit forms to be about the size of your thumb, at least for tomatoes, you, you side dress it with another long-acting um, fertilizer. And then you might want to do it once or twice if it's in a garden bed. After that, you may not need to. Just keep an eye on your plant. But if it's in a uh, container, you'll have to fertilize it probably every couple weeks with a, a slow release fertilizer it's it's your plant will tell you if you look at it and it doesn't look like it's doing well if it's too much green cut back if it's the leaves are turning pale yellow then then you need to add some uh, another thing people ask us about why didn't your broccoli buckle well it bolted and cauliflower is even worse and the most common trigger is when you plant it, if you start it or buy it from a, a uh, like from our plant sale, which it came directly from the greenhouse, or if you bought it from Wilco, it came directly from a greenhouse. The cold temperatures uh, coming out of a nice warm greenhouse will trigger that. And if there's too much or too little uh, moisture in the soil, that'll also trigger bolting. And so does low fertility, especially nitrogen. So to reduce the problem that you might see with that, the plants shouldn't be any more than four weeks old when they're transplanted, and you might want to help protect them from the cold with row covers for a while. And that should help some of those kind of plants from bolting. 
So we're going to talk about a common sense approach to plant problems. And I didn't want to use the term integrated pest management because that sounds too technical and it really isn't all that technical. Basically, what it is, is go out there every morning with your coffee or every evening with a beer or both and monitor what's going on in your garden. If you don't go out there, you're not going to catch problems early on. You, you will you'll look, if you find a problem, you use a variety of common sense methods to take care of the problem, to control it. Go back out and assess it. Is that working? No. Then we, you know, we're going to see if we need to escalate. You might want to consider tolerating harmless pests because if you don't have any pests, then your garden is not attractive to beneficial insects and you want beneficial insects there. So if you see a few aphids, just keep an eye on them. You can squish them because you're not going to get them all, but the, the beneficial insects will get the word that there are aphids because the chemicals that are released by the plants that are in stress send out uh, signals, and that's when the uh, beneficial insects come. Um, set a threshold to decide when it's time to act. If you've got, if your uh, plant is starting to get overrun, it's time to act, but not everything needs to be treated. And then once you do treat, you go back again to number one and see how it's doing. And you just keep on going through this all season long. And, and gardening is not a once and done thing. Gardening is an interactive um, exercise. So some of the things that you want to do in addition to, we, we talked about the soil test, is you need good airflow. That's why a lot of people prune their tomatoes. You want to get a lot of good airflow in there. You don't want to prune too much. There's a proper way to do that. And if you, Gary will give you the link to our website. There's a how to, I think it's how to grow a red tomato in the Pacific Northwest. There are specific um, instructions there how to prune a tomato if you want to do that. And the most important thing, again, is keep a really close look. One of the ways that you can keep insects is to control access to your plants with a row cover, which you can see on the uh, laying like a blanket over the plants there. It lets light in, but keeps the insects out. And there are certain times a year when you would expect certain insects, and that's when you would cover them. Um, and we'll talk more about those as we get into the rest of the talk. You, um, mulch, if you put a good mulch on your garden, that's going to help keep the moisture in and keep that consistent moisture that we were talking about. Some plants can be protected from, for example, uh, cutworms that live in the soil. During the night, they come out at night and they climb up your plant, chop it off, or they eat the leaves. If you put a collar around the base of the plant, that will help. Um, to plant trap crops, there are a lot of things that you can do with that. You, For example, if you get uh, flea beetles or other kind of pests on your squash plants, uh, you, or the cucumber beetles, another one of those, you can plant some, you know, nondescript but very attractive to bugs squash on a, a place that's kind of far from the rest of your garden and it'll probably, and plant those before you would plant your plants, it'll attract the bad guys. Once those accumulate on that trap plant, you can spray it and pull the plant out. Um, uh, nasturtiums are a good plant for that because they almost always have aphids, and that will bring the beneficial insects into your garden, and those aphids don't get on your garden plants. They only go on aphids. Same thing with uh, crepe myrtle. Plant a crepe myrtle tree and you will have aphids. They aren't the kind to get on your garden, but boy, it brings in the beneficial insects. And once they're in the neighborhood, you've got somebody in your garden that's got your back. Um, you can use repellents, diatomaceous earth for the crawling insects, which, you know, that's what they tell us. But in my experience, the slugs that we have here, they laugh at diatomaceous earth. They could probably crawl over ground glass and be okay. Pheromone lures are good. Um, they're insect specific and they should not be placed, for example, yellow jacket lures. They need to be placed far away from your yard because, or at least from where you're going to be, because they will bring the insects there. And you have to make sure that you're changing them often. 
So how do you treat a specific insect? The first thing is you have to know what it is. And if you can't, if you don't know what it is, call the plant and insect clinic. Um, Gary has that information. And we're, we're open for business. So send us pictures by email. Uh, call in. We can call you back. But get a, the definite identification of the insect before you go treating it. We can also help you with the least toxic methods. Uh, thumb and forefinger is probably the best. If, if you're out there every day, you can stop a lot of problems just by squishing. Um, there are biological controls out there like uh, nem uh, beneficial nematodes that for soil dwelling problems. And that BT is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a really great uh, biological uh, insecticide for caterpillars. Very, very, very low toxicity to humans, if any. Um, and we can help you choose out of a list of a lot of different pesticides which ones are the lowest toxicity. And I'm sure that's what all we're we're all trying to do. That. Some of the plants or some of the insecticides we use, like pyrethrins that you're going to hear me talk about, they don't have any residual, but the, uh, you've got to cover the insect directly with it. It's not one of those things you can spray on the leaves and hope the insect will eat. It doesn't work that way. And you really, truly want to avoid some of these that you would get at any, some of the big box stores that says, this will kill anything because you're going to kill the beneficial insects too. So read the ID, or ID the insect and read the label. More is not better. Find the product that solves the problem and we can help you choose that. Don't buy too much. One of our master gardeners today was talking today that uh, she's only been married a couple years and she moved into the house where her now husband has lived for a number of years and they've got stuff that's probably been there for 20 years. Buy only what you need for that growing season. And make sure that you pay attention to the warnings and follow all directions to protect yourself, you know, pets and the uh, insects, or not insects, I'm sorry, birds and pets. This is an example of a label. There's no warning on it, this one. A lot of times there's a target um, uh, target uh, notation on it. This is very low toxicity to humans, so there isn't one, but it tells you how to mix it, how to apply it. It tells you what the environmental hazards are, and this is one of the, the uh, pesticides, if you need a pesticide, that we recommend most often because it's a naturally occurring um, bacteria that lives in the soil, but it's really toxic to a lot of different insects. And to protect the bees and other um, beneficial insects, if you Put this on late at night, like you know, nine o'clock when the bees are gone to bed. In three hours' time, it won't be toxic to the bees. Also on the label, you're going to see the crops that you can use it on and the pests that are controlled. And then at the very end there, it says how many days to wait until you can harvest it and eat it. And it tells you that too. So all this information is very important when you decide that you, it's gotten to the point where you have to use a pesticide. Okay, let's get into the specific pests. Um, slugs, everybody loves them, of course. They're there all the time. Um, if One of the things you can do is go out at night with a pair of scissors and cut them in half because that they come out at night, or put a board there and kind of you know spray under the board with water. And it makes it nice and moist, and it's a good hidey place. And then come out in the morning and collect the um, slugs that form, that have collected there and put them in a pail of soapy water. Um, my husband accidentally left a pan of uh, chicken feed out there out in our garden, and it got wet. And when I came to morning, I, I have never seen so many slugs in my life. And I collected every single one of them and put them in a pail of soapy water. And that really cut down on the population out there. And you'd be surprised how much it helped. Um, our slugs start to mate when their first rains start in the fall. You want to control them before they get there, because if you don't, you see all those little eggs there? They look like little pearls in the soil. 
Those are slug eggs. You don't want those in your soil. You want them out. And if you're keeping control of the slug population, you can help cut down on next year's very easily. Um, it's like it's a, birds, uh, birds, or chickens like them, ducks like them, and that'll help too. If you're going to use a product, uh, bait, avoid anything with metaldehyde in it because they're toxic to pets and birds. But iron phosphate um, pet, uh, slug baits are pretty good. They will deter the the slugs really well and aren't toxic. Let's get into some real insects. And just as a kind of general, chewing insects leave holes. And the chewing insects in our area are the larvae of butterflies, moths, and soft flies, and flies. Because the moths and butterflies have caterpillars, which make the holes in the cabbage that you see there. The soft flies, um, you can see the rose slugs and the bottom left picture. They're eating holes in the leaves and making, they're just eating the soft tissue in the leaves. And uh, flies, the maggots of those will eat roots. So anything that chews, that's where they're coming from. The piercing sucking insects like aphids and leafhoppers, thrips, spider mites, they create white spots, but not not usually holes. Aphids, the bottom right there you can see, they cause curling, twisting um, foliage. And sometimes it can be hard to tell between that and pesticide damage. But you can usually look at the underside of the leaf and you can either see aphids or see the cast off skins that the aphids were there and are no longer there. This is what aphids look like. I think you've all seen them. You can go out with a, your thumb and forefinger and squish them. You can get a cotton ball and um, gently wipe them down, but be careful not to hurt. Check the leaf. Try it on one leaf first. If it doesn't hurt the leaf, then you can use the alcohol in a, a ball. The other thing that you can do if they are really overrunning things is hose them off there and then use a, a very low toxicity um, insecticide like neem or the, the safer brand killing soap here. Again, plant a trap crop like nasturtions to encourage beneficial insects. And don't over fertilize. If you get that really lush, green, thick growth, the, the, uh, a lot of the insects, including aphids, love it. Spider mites, they're another one. Don't over fertilize. And this is the kind of thing you'll see with spider mites. If you see leaf stippling, that's what they call that, um, that kind of white look on the green leaves you can uh, and you'll see maybe minimal little spider webs there use a magnifying glass to look under the leaves because they really are tiny hose them with water as much as you can uh, if you don't get rid of them if the beneficial insects don't take care of them then you may want to step up um, you can use bonide uh, rid bugs I want to show you, before we go any further, if I can, WSU has a site called HortSense, and that's in our, take our handout too. This is a really great place to get the, um, some of the non-toxic pesticides in general care. So let's go to vegetables, and let's go back to, this is a bean plant on the one I was just showing you. Let's go to beans. And you've identified spider mites. It tells you what they are, their life cycle, how to take care of it, and some of the pesticides that they, that contain the active ingredient that will be, uh, that use it. Any of the pesticides that I'm talking about here are examples. They aren't something that I'm saying, you've got to go out and buy just these pesticides. These are the active ingredients that we're talking about. Flea beetles. These are from my garden. I was very upset when I went out there the other day and I saw flea beetle damage. It's very distinctive. Look at the picture in the middle there. The They really don't hurt your plants too much if they're 
they get on the new plants, the seedlings, they can kill them. But usually in the big plants, they're just kind of unsightly. One of the things you can do is plant a radishes kind of far away from the main uh, plants, and they'll get on the radishes. And like Obi said before, let them congregate there, treat them, and then plant your your other plants like your tomatoes, your turnips, your um, they get on squash. Well, I went out there yesterday, and, you know, I'm a master gardener, and I know better, but the first thing I wanted to do was go grab a spray and kill them because I hate them on my plants. They have no business there. But I got to looking, and I turned a leaf over, and look what I found. It's a little spider. It's a candy striped spider. It's a cobweb spider, and it had, it doesn't show it there, but it had a um, one of those flea beetles in its mouth. So I let it go. I figure the little spider can take care of a lot of it. There were probably other insects there. There was one that got away. I couldn't see what it was. It, my, my phone couldn't catch it fast enough. But I guess my point here is you've got to reach a tolerance level. I'm going to let them go. So far, they haven't been, done too much damage. And if I sprayed something, I'd probably kill that spider and anything else in there that's actually trying to take care of the plant. If you've got over 30% uh, of the leaves are damaged on young plants, then it might be time to do something about it with a, a pesticide. But you have to decide that for yourself. Kind of get used to being able to tolerate a little bit of damage. Caterpillars, they eat holes, they skeletonize the leaves. Row covers are effective because you can usually see the butterflies or moths flying around, not the moths, they're out at night. But for example, the, um, the cabbage loopers are coming out about now and the cab imported cabbage worm. If you see those little butterflies with the, with the white wings, if you see them flying, cover your plants with a row cover like I showed you back there. You can, they let the light in, like I said, and it'll protect the plants. You won't have nearly as much damage. You can get those row covers, you can get them online and on Amazon, and I think you can get them just about anywhere that they sell garden things. A lot of the predators, like paper, like wasps, parasitic flies, those kind of things, they'll come and help take care of them. But really, avoid the broad-spectrum uh, pesticides because they'll kill all the beneficial insects, too. Treat the caterpillars while they're really tiny, and you can use the, that BT I told you about, but you've got to start them when they're, the insects are very small. They'll eat it and they'll, they'll die. The climbing caterpillars are a lot more challenging because they live in the soil during the day and come out at night. This is the time when you might want to try one of the collars around the base of the plants. And some of the nematodes, the beneficial nematodes, can be worked into the soil. Now, this box, is this. you can get them a lot of different places, but this is, seems to be, this Arbico Organics seems to be the main distributor of them. They, there are specific instructions for putting them in the soil. This costs, I think, like 30 bucks, which is expensive. However, once they're in the soil, they will stay alive by eating the bad stuff in the soil. So it might, if you're troubled with um, things, with, with, uh, maggots in the soil that are eating the roots of your plants or with cl these climbing caterpillars that live in the soil, it might be worth your while to get them in your garden. In case nobody has knows what this is, if you've ever seen this in your soil, these are the pupae of different kinds of butterfly and, and moth of caterpillars that will again come up next year and be in your garden. And when I told you about using row covers, the problem with row covers is if you had that problem last year and the, the, um, the pupa is in your soil and you cover it with a row cover, then you've just created a super duper buffet for the emerging adults. So if you've had the problem before, don't use a row cover. Just use your eyes and get out there and make sure you catch the problem early. Leaf miners are another problem that we see on spinach and uh, uh, Swiss chard, these kind of things, and it can just ruin them. 
One of the things you need to do is rotate your crops because these two pupate in the soil. And if you put them in the same soil where they were last year when the, the um, adults emerge, then they will be on your plants again. One of the things you can do if you see a little bit of damage is go out and pinch the leaves because the larvae are in between the top layer of the leaf and the bottom layer. You won't see them. Insecticides don't work because the, the larva is protected inside the leaf. And so you've got to be aware of it. The, the only things that you can do is get out there and squish infected leaves, get rid of them. Don't put them in the uh, compost bin, put them in the trash or burn them. And uh, don't plant in the same place. Cucumber beetle, we have mostly that a spotted cucumber beetle, and they can really make a mess of your uh, cucumbers. Use trap crops like we were talking before. Plant them a little bit away from your garden so they attract them. Get them all on that trap plant and kill them and then pull that plant out. And use a row cover in June, but remove it as soon as they start to flower because you need to they're, they're not pollinated by when they need insects for pollination, or humans for that matter. Wireworms. This is another thing that beneficial nematodes might help. There's been some indication, some suggestion from research that they might help. Uh, it's a heartbreaking thing. It, it'll ruin your, your um, potatoes, onions, um, carrots. We've seen a lot of that this year. One of the things that I would suggest if you've had problems with potatoes or uh, onions or carrots, grow them in five-gallon buckets. That'll protect them. They will grow very happy there if, if you've had this problem before. You can plant resistant varieties of potatoes. And again, I think I put that inform I know I put that information up on the handout, which one are, are resistant. The other thing you can do is when you rotate the crops, plant things like uh, cauliflower and cabbage in the area. They aren't um, prone to getting damage from that. You can cut away any damaged part of the vegetable, though, and still use it. It's okay. And the birds and chickens will get it if you get them, if you turn over your soil in the fall. And that'll help to cut down the population of them next year. And here's some of the other root attacking insects. And you can try beneficial nematodes for these two, the carrot rust fly and then the cabbage root maggot. These are both little flies, two different flies. And if they get on the green parts of the plant above ground, they um, lay eggs on the leaves and then the maggots um, crawl down and into the soil and then start eating on the roots. You can cover, it's probably a good idea if you've never had this problem before or if you see it on one you know, one plant, cover with a row cover at the time of year that you see this happening, and that'll help to cut down on the incidence. And again, you're going to need to either rotate your crops or um, with carrots. Carrots grow really, really well in, in five-gallon buckets. That might be something you want to give a try. And you can see them in the radish just working their way in. Brown marmorated stink bug is another one that we're having trouble with. Take a look at this. This is what they look like. They're like teeny tiny little spiders when they first come out. If you see little white eggs like this, get rid of that leaf. This is what the young'uns look like, and then this is what the adults look like. This is the damage that they cause. Um, the only time they're vulnerable to any kind of insecticide is when they're at this stage. And when they're this size, there's not a lot you can do. You can um, cover things with fine netting to prevent them from laying eggs. And when they're in the, trying to get into your house, you have to seal all the openings, and then you vacuum them up and get rid of them. They don't do any damage in the house. They're just a real nuisance. But any of these crops that you see up here, cover them if, if you are having problems, if you see a lot of the uh, brown marmorated stink bugs around. I bit into a, a raspberry last year. I'd seen some, some of the... Uh, stink bugs around and I bit into a raspberry last year. It looked fine. And it came it came right out of my mouth, just right right across the yard. It was disgusting and it was definitely a stink bug. If you've ever accidentally bit into a stink bug, you know what I mean. I found one on a salad once and unfortunately I found it in my mouth before it came out. Don't want to talk about that. 
So corn earworms, if you're growing corn, this is what they look like. That, that's what the pupa looks like. You'll see that in the soil. One of the things that you can do is plant varieties with tight husks around them so that the, um, the butterfly, the moth, I'm sorry, can't get in there and lay its eggs. And you can place a clothespin at the top where the silk is, and that'll help prevent them from coming in too. And the other thing you can do, just like you did with uh, oh, the, uh, losing my, the wireworms, plow or dig up the plots, and that way the pupae are exposed to the elements and the birds and the ducks and the chickens. And they also bother other ones too, other insects, or other plants, I'm sorry. This is a really, really bad bug, this spotted wing drosophila. If you've ever picked strawberries or raspberries and brought them into the kitchen and set them on your counter and came back a couple of week, couple days, or I'm sorry, a couple hours later and saw them just crawling with teeny tiny little white worms, that's what it is. These are relatives of vinegar flies that you see around rotting fruit, but these lay them, lay their eggs on living fruit and the eggs hatch, and you'll find these little larvae in them. Uh, I've seen them on cherries, plums, raspberries, strawberries, and blackberries. And the only way that you can do is to take care of them is to get out there and monitor them. Um, I've put uh, links to how to trap them, and that's you can't control the problem that way, but you can tell if there's, they're out there. One way, you and then you treat them. Um, pick the fruit immediately. Even if you don't have the problem, pick ripe fruit immediately and get anything that's fallen from the uh, bush off the ground because that will attract them true too. Last year, I covered everything with, with mosquito netting, netting, and I had no problem last year. If you're going to use any of these organic um, pesticides, use them at night. Follow the directions because we want to protect the uh, other insects. And again, this is one of those where you can only treat for the adults. If you already have the, um, you know, the worms inside your fruit, it's not going to take care of them. Pesticides for, I mean, raspberry must be listed if you're going to use them on raspberries. Needless to say, these soft skin fruits, when you spray something on them, you're getting it on the fruit and in the fruit. And you want to make sure that whatever it is you're using won't remain there when you eat it. Real quick here, I guess we're, man, it goes fast, doesn't it? Vegetable diseases and disorders. Diseases are caused by a pathogen, and you have to have both the host, the disease, and the, the, the environment that will cause this to happen. Disorders can be ca are caused by environmental conditions, and like too much water, too little water, and those listed there. Pottery mildew is a disease. It is caused by a fungus. You will find this on every cucumber and squash plant toward the end of the year. Um, give them room to grow. Make sure there's good um, airflow that will help to minimize it. Don't fertilize them too much because it also makes them more vulnerable. Planting resistant varieties helps. As soon as you see the first yellowish indication on the leaf that you've got um, that, that it's coming, use one of these chemical management things. And the problem is if it gets on the, too many of the leaves, it destroys the leaves' of ability to uh, photosynthesize, which is why you really want to get a uh, jump on it because it'll destroy the plant. Late blight is something that we almost always see at the end of the year. Uh, another good reason to uh, prune your tomato plants. If you see that there is a forecast of rain, say in August or well, any time, any time you see there's going to be a couple days of rain, you may want to pre-treat your tomatoes and peppers with one of these copper-based fungicides or chlorothalonil. Um, but again, read the directions. Do it before that, before the rain is forecast, and that might protect them. Because you can have gone all summer, and you've got this beautiful plant and wonderful fruit developing, and once the blight hits it, they're dunners. The, um, this is that disease that caused the Irish potato famine, and it's, it'll kill your plants. Verticillium wilt is another one that's kind of heartbreaking. It's... Uh, a fungus that is in the soil, 
and the plants will wilt almost, well, really quickly they'll wilt and you'll see V-shaped, see, see V-shaped yellowing and notching and, and burning look to the leaves. The stem tissues, if you cut part off, will have this brown discoloration in them. It usually doesn't kill the plant if it's a well-established plant, but it really reduces the, um, your plant's ability to, to um, produce good fruit. So you want to plant disease-resistant, uh, plant the resistant seeds and clean up and destroy every single bit of that plant. And don't plant tomatoes or peppers or eggplants in that area again. You could plant beans or cauliflower, but not tomatoes. <coughs> Excuse me. These are abiotic problems of tomatoes, and, and a lot of them occur to, um, apply to peppers too. This is sun scald. If, if, for example, with verticillium wilt you've got, or you prune too much, you don't have enough leaves covering the, um, the new fruit, and you may see that this weekend if you have any fruit, they'll get sun scald on them. Um, so if I'm going to be covering my tomatoes up with uh, row covers this weekend, this coming weekend. This is blossom end rot. It's due to the plant's inability to use the calcium, calcium that's available in the soil. We have plenty of calcium usually available in our soil. The problem is it can't use it, um, mostly because of inconsistent moisture. Again, it's extremely important to keep your soil moist. Um, people say that, oh, but if I use Epsom salts, that'll help. Don't use Epsom, Epsom salts. That's magnesium sulfate, and it doesn't cause a problem. Or we don't have a problem with magnesium either, and it won't fix blossom end rot. Vivipary is when the seeds, usually in older tomatoes, the seeds in older tomatoes kind of lose that coating that keeps them from germinating, and they start germinating inside the tomato. My husband came to me with a green, uh, his face was green. He says, oh, my God, you got to see the tomato. He thought it was worms in the tomato when actually all it was was little, little tomato plants starting inside the uh, tomato. No big deal. They're just old. Cat facing usually happens when something happens to the, um, the blossom before it sets fruit. And you'll end up with cat facing like that. Some varieties will do that really easily and others won't. Um, San Marzano will split and sometimes have cat facing. That's a known problem. Leaf roll problems in tomatoes. This is physiologic leaf roll. We didn't have much of that this year. We did last year because it was so doggone cold and the leaves just roll up like that. Everything looks healthy. They had put out nice new growth, but the cur leaves curled and it's nothing to worry about. Curly top virus is something we don't have here um, on this side of the Cascades, but it can cause something similar to this herbicide damage picture that I showed you earlier. So it can be kind of hard to tell. The physiologic leaf roll, like I said, there's not a lot you can do about it. And you may have a problem with that this weekend because it also occurs in temperatures over 95. Again, might want to try to put a row cover on them this coming weekend. Potatoes, here are some problems with the potatoes. Have you ever seen that greening? That's because they were exposed to the light. If you see that happening with your potatoes, cover them up, start killing them, cover them so that they don't get exposed to the light because it produces a toxin that won't kill us. You can peel it off, but it's not, you know, it's not a good potato. Scab is another soil-borne disease. Um, don't lime the soil where you're going to plant potatoes because a slightly acidic soil will help to deter scab from forming. Bacterial ring rot is another problem, and don't plant potatoes in a place where bacteri bacterial ring rot is formed. Those usually come from infected seed potatoes, so make sure that you get them from a, a place that certifies that they are bacterial ring rot free. Hollow heart, if you've ever seen this, this is, this is caused from, um, it's basically the same thing as blossom end rot on a tomato, but this is the potato version. Keep your soil nice and evenly moist throughout the growing season. This is another, this rhizoctonia blight or scurf is another potato problem that's caused by a fungus and you, you can just peel, you, actually you could peel both of these off and the potatoes are fine to eat. And Again, the rhizoctonia 
don't, there are some that are resistant. Make sure you find out what they are and plant those, but don't plant them in the same place. Corn problems. Corn, in order to fertilize well, needs to be planted in blocks. Rows don't have a chance to fertilize as well because they are fertilized by the wind. This, these uh, corn stalks don't have enough um, nitrogen. They obviously had a lot of rain and the nitrogen leached out of the soil, and this is what it looks like. Um, I put a couple of articles in there about how to take care of corn. They need um, more nitrogen. They're very heavy nitrogen feeders, and they need a lot of water. And this is what happens when there's pollination failure. Each one of those silks need, needs to be pollinated. Planting your... Um, your corn in blocks like this will help prevent that. Onions and garlic, they can get some molds or funguses that live in the soil. And they're, this one's really bad, it, this white rot. It stays in the soil for 10 years. And I don't know how long the, this stays in, but I, sometimes I think it's better to just grow them in raised beds because you have much less incidence of that kind of problem. Cabbages, boron deficiency, that you might see this in our area. I know I've seen this in grocery stores. I um, put instructions on how to add boron to your soil. It's, yeah, you've got to be, use a really, really light hand at it. And the instructions are very specific. I think you use a teaspoon of laundry borax per gallon and just sprinkle it over a, a 10 by 10 area. Club root is a really nasty disease. It's, um, I think broccoli is, is hurt the worst. And there's not a lot you can do about that either. Don't plant um, those kind of vegetables of the cabbage family in that soil. Here's some abiotic problems of carrots. We are almost done. I know you're glad. Split roots, um, that's usually from inconsistent soil moisture. You can get forking like this. You, that can from, be from uneven watering, um, too much nitrogen, uh, soil that is impeding their growth in this area, so they go that way. Um, planting them too close together. Um, this, it was in nice soil at the top, and then at the bottom, it, was, it ran into clay. This is one of our master gardeners. And I think this was probably due to inconsistent soil moisture, but I'm not really sure what that is. But carrots are very funny about that. And again, I think probably the safest thing to do is grow them in a five-gallon bucket or a deep raised bed. Uh, poor pollination, you often see this early in the season. It looks like you're getting a really nice zucchini or cucumber or squash, and then it dies. Well, what happens is the um, female flower started to form its zucchini and when it didn't get pollinated then it just stopped growing so what you can do is go out very early in the morning the male looks like this there's no little baby zucchini or squash on it peel off the petals open up the female flower and touch the, the male stamen to the female stigma and you'll get good pollination and if there are some that we didn't cover, that site on HortSense I gave you will show you all the problems that occur here in the Pacific Northwest and how to take care of them. And make sure that you always use the least toxic options. And if you have any question about the problem that you're dealing with, please contact, contact us at the Plant and Insect Clinic. So today what we covered are the different general growing problems, the monitoring, setting your limits on how much you can tolerate treating and going back and keep checking in it checking on it we talked about the different insect problems and the plant diseases and disorders that you might encounter um, this will be available uh, in pdf form on the website gary will give you that and not today but probably later and if you want this, you can get to it, and it gives you a, a really good idea of the type of things that are least toxic, and then all the different resources. And that I've, that's all I've got. If anybody has any questions, I know you've stayed on a long time, so if you have any questions.